Mustafa Akiol, it's a pleasure to have you here. And I must uh, first say that if anybody's listening to this interview and has not heard your speech, just just turn off this interview and go and listen to your speech. It was magnificent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. And uh, I, I, I was also very honored by the, all the feedback I got from the audience, really. Uh, well, it was a mind-blowing speech. And if I could give it a special title, I would call it An Introduction to Tolerance. Do you know what I mean? That sounds pretty good, yeah. An introduction to tolerance. Um, because it's, uh, you explained Islam. And do you know how little we understand about Islam in this country? Well, there are people who un understand Islam, and there are people who misunderstand it. And there are people who want to promote that particular misunderstanding for various reasons. Some of them are political, I guess. Uh, and yeah, I see the problem there. I mean, uh, I mean America has the right to be concerned about some of the extremists in the Muslim world, certainly. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't define the Islamic civilization. That, that, that doesn't define Islamic history. But uh, there are people who want to see it that way, and they're certainly mistaken in that perspective. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the state. Uh, it's the state again and again. But, but what struck me I, during your whole talk, almost every slice of history that you uh, pulled out and explained, whether you were dis uh, discussing... Um, uh, uh, the, whole, the, the jihad or uh, various ways to interpret uh, Islamic uh, scriptures, there is an analogy in the West. The same problems, the same disputes, the same uh, l struggle between liberty and control. Exactly. Do you see what I mean? Exactly. And actually in my book, uh, in my upcoming book, Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty, I, when I'm discussing these issues, I sometimes go and look at the Christian example as well. Uh, same discussions about whether reason should have a role in understanding religion and, or it should be dogmatic. That was made in, in Christendom as well. Discussions about whether the state represents God or not were made uh, in, in both civilizations. Uh, certainly, they, they are many, they're similar because they are mo Abrahamic monotheism. I mean, they come from the same roots. There's a tendency to think that Islam is something totally alien. And even people like think that the term Allah, the Muslims term for God, they think it's, it's a different deity or yeah. something. Well, I mean, the, the opening words of the Quran are quite frequently misrendered uh, in uh, the Western press as there's no God but Allah. But uh, the right Allah term, means the God in yeah, Arabic. There's no God but God, yeah. which is a, a yeah. profound line. And that's why, uh, yeah. why Arabic-speaking Christians use the term Allah as well. Yeah, there's no other word in Arabic other than Allah. Yeah. Again, almost everything you said, I mean, it was a revelation. Um, about six months ago, eight months ago, I wrote you and, and asked you what I should read. And you recommend a, a wonderful book that I have read and read and read. It's called The Jewel of the World. The Ornament of the, the ornament World. The Ornament of the World. And it, and it discusses this, this convivencia. Is that the right pronunciation? Conviven convivencia. I guess so, yeah. Yeah. Of, of a 700-year period of uh, coming together of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism in really Cordoba and surrounding areas in Spain. And uh, it's been such an education uh, for me. Oh, I mean, thank you. It's, it's, it's a really great book. And that Spanish example uh, really has lots to say about the history of Islam. One thing about Islam, which is natural, is that since Islam came after Judaism and Christianity, it accepted their legitimacy. Like it said, well, they are God's revelations and they have lots of truths. It disagreed profoundly in some, some theological ways, particularly with Christianity, but it, it said they have the rights to practice and they're the people of the book. Uh, the Islamic law did not grant them equal status, but that came in the 19th century when the Ottoman Empire, you know, gave the idea, uh, gave the right to be equal citizens to Jews and Christians. And when you look at the Ottoman Parliament in the 19th century, one third was non-Muslims. Non well, and let's uh, let's be clear on what you mean by not equal status. I mean it means that uh, Christians and Jews must pay a small tax, exactly, and, uh, a tax. But this tax is nothing like a modern tax. 
Exactly. Right? I and, mean, this is nothing. Yeah, and right. they pay the tax and they're exempt from military service, where, to which Muslims are subscribed to. So <laughs> actually, when, when, when the equal, equality came in late Ottoman Empire, some Christians said, we don't want equality. <laughs> we would rather pay the tax and not go to the military. But this is, um, I, I know you understand uh, the way American politics are shaking out these days, but, uh, you know, Islam has, is the new um, how do you say? I mean, it's a kind of the new um, communism, the new yeah. great fear. And this is very recent. And so your message, um, uh, which, uh, your historical message and your doctrinal message is uh, probably the most important thing that Americans could ever hear. And it's a challenging one. Thank you. I mean, I think Americans should think that, I mean, Islam is sitting there for 14 centuries and only in the past decade that the West thinks that Even, Islam is so horrible. I, know. <laughs> I, mean, I just happened to notice it. Exactly. Well, like, I mean, the, yeah. w w w what was it before, like in the 50s and 60s and 70s and in the 19th century? I mean, Muslims were already there and it was not an issue. Now it became an issue mainly because of a political crisis and because some people want to exaggerate the problem in both sides of the conflict. Well, and it was striking too about your lecture is the, the expanse of time in which you're, you're speaking. And that's mind blowing for Americans who think only maybe as uh, far back as. Uh, a uh, hundred or two hundred years, I mean, as, as his, but you know, in the in the ninth century, for example, and you would in your lecture tonight, you quite frequently discuss the whole swath of this of the Middle Ages in, in a way that uh, we don't often think about. But in the ninth century, uh, under Islamic rule, in the city of Cordoba. Um, paved streets, lit streets, uh, gigantic libraries, 10 times, 100 times larger than any library in all of Christendom. Um, uh, pu public baths, hundreds and hundreds of public baths. Civilization uh, in, the, in the ninth century Cordoba, where it didn't exist anywhere else yeah, exactly. uh, under Islamic rule. Exactly. Actually, there's a priest in uh, the ninth century, if I'm not wrong, uh, in North Africa, and he complains how the Christians are fascinated by the Arab Muslim culture. And he said, everybody's reading Arab books. Nobody reads the, you know, the Latin, you know, the scriptures anymore. Uh, he basically accuses them to be Muslim wannabes. Yes, of course. And actually there's a term that created at the, at the time uh, among Christians called Mozarab, which means Arab wannabe, literally. Mm -hmm. So the Muslim culture was so fascinating and attractive that, you know, uh, people were being drawn to that from Europe and the more, you know, uh, authoritative voices in Europe were complaining from that, which is completely opposite today, uh, which is com like, you know, it's, it's the Western culture, obviously, which is attractive and which has the greatest libraries and nicest streets and so on. And the Muslims are attracted to it, which shows us that the problem in, in either medieval Europe or in contemporary Islamic world is not something, the problems or let's say, it's not something inherent in those religions. These are just historical fluctuations based on politics, economics, and you know lots of many lots of factors. Uh, and it shows that religions can take different roles and, and forms uh, throughout uh, history. Of course, and the state is always anxious. Those who want power and who believe in violence or are willing to use whatever the prevailing cultural paradigm, religious paradigm is, whether it's Christianity or Judaism or Islam. Exactly. Exactly. Else. And and same thing. I mean, in the Muslim world, some of the uh, warmongering people. I mean, not in a in a very maybe state oriented way, but even in the like in an individual like terrorist groups, they do have some power relations. Certainly, I mean, they they want to have an achieve a status among in the community of heroism and so on. Um, but if he just tr if he can look to what Islam is or what Christianity is. Uh, by you know putting aside all those power relations, we see a much more refreshing picture. I would say yes, yes. And uh, part of your lecture, I particularly appreciated, although it was totally totally unnecessary for you to do this, but wise was to draw attention to the Islamic uh, Arabic contribution to uh, the modernity, really. And um, you know, we we're talking about Spain, and we at the Mises Institute have often talked about the birth of economic science in Spain. You know, coming out of this period, the long period of time where you had this merging of cultures, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and um, out of which comes these uh, centers of learning, and then the birth of economic science in something like the 13th, uh, 14th century, which, which is an, a compelling story, uh, because the clash, or not the clash, but the coming together of these traditions gives rise to... Um, modernity and then also to the prosperity of Spain 
exactly. which 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 was much more prosperous than England or any other exactly. place. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, that is the success of Islamic civilization. I mean, the big success of I think medieval Islamic uh, civilization lies in its pluralism. Since the Islamic law gave uh, space for Christians and Jews, they continued to exist uh, in Islamic uh, in the Islamic world, and they brought in contributions. Or Muslims also learned from the Hindus and their philosophy, or Jewish philosophy. So the, 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 when you have many elements together, you know, uh, arguing, discussing, and learning from each other, you have a vibrant civilization. And that was enriched by trade, which was, and the Muslim world was at the center of the world trade routes. Right. So you, you find that these religions become far more tolerant of uh, other religions when there's an economic interest to do so. Exactly, right. exactly. And the same thing was true in Christianity. Like 17th century Holland became the p place for where, you know, the argument for religious tolerance emerged uh, strongly. It was a place for merchants and, you know, who were, whose job was compelling them to be more tolerant. And the same thing for, uh, too, was like Basra or Baghdad, which was quite diverse. But on the other hand, in, in the Saudi in today's Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, there was a much more harsh and rigid Islamic interpretation. And uh, in the 20th century, thanks to oil money, that interpretation became very fashionable right. uh, and popular throughout the world. So you cut off trade and uh, it, it, it makes it, it fuels a kind of um, uh, fundamentalism. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it stagnates a culture, which ultimately leads to intolerance to other cultures. Right. And, and freezes a doctrine, even religious doctrine, that the doctrines form around the, the world that people experience. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And the fact that, for example, in the Muslim, uh, in the medieval Muslim culture, there are many Islamic scholars, all have Latinized names. Like Al, uh, like Al Kindi is known as Al Kindus, or Far Farabi is known as Al Faribus in, in, in the West, or Avicenna is Ibn Rushd. Uh, the reason why they be, be, or you know, like uh, the uh, the term algorithm, as I said in my uh, class, comes from Al Kharizmi, you know, a Muslim mathematician of the time. And the, the reason is that you know there was there was this translation, and it's not too different today that you know Muslims read about John Locke or you know or Hayek or Mises that you know they have these discoveries, some intellectual discoveries. So th there has always been this you know interaction between civilizations. Yes. The question is, can we keep them peaceful? which contributes to those civilizations. But if it becomes violent, if it becomes militarist, if it becomes imperialist, then that leads to bigger and bigger problems. Well, and one way to prevent that is to increase understanding, and in particular, uh, understanding of history, and to understand the Islamic contribution to, to, uh, to modern civilization is absolutely critical. I mean, we have Islam bringing to the West all the writings of the ancient, not all of the writers, but uh, the majority of the writings of the ancient philosophers was brought to us by and preserved and brought to us by Islam. Te technology, the most advanced technology of the Middle Ages, was was a was a gift of Islam to the world, and we need to understand this in order to. Um, I hate to say it, but for Americans to humanize their world. Exactly, uh, exactly. I mean, um, like Muslims should. One problem, though, within Muslims is that they just are proud of that heritage. Uh, but they don't engage in something new then. They just live in the past. So maybe the West has a problem of not knowing or appreciating the Muslim civilization in the Middle Ages, which was brilliant in many ways. Uh, and the Muslim, one problem in the modern world is Muslims prefer to live in that glorious past and not face some of, it, some of today's problems. Uh, whereas I would say, let's take, as a Muslim, I would say, let's take inspiration from our past but let's uh, let's look at today and let's live uh, in today's world. Try to bring our values today to today's world, but try to reform that values because I mean, try to reform the way those values were expressed, you know, in, in medieval times. So, in some sense, the fact that Islam has a glorious history uh, has captured some Muslims' minds in, in today's world, thinking that they don't need to learn from other cultures. That, that was actually like quite uh, f phenomenal. When you look at Ottoman history, the Ottomans don't think that the West can teach them anything until the late 18th century. So they consider that they are superior anyway. And they were superior for like militarily and culturally, but th but the West started to rise, modernity started to rise in the West, and it was a little late to discover that. They tried to catch up. Uh, and they did some important reforms in the 19th century. But then the problem became modernity threatening them, which made them reactionary. Not, not the Ottomans, but later yeah, Muslims. But it's, 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 it's the same problem we face in the West with, with Christianity. There are many types. 
Exactly. There's a, there's a tolerant, a liberally minded, progressive uh, Christianity that's nonetheless doctrinally orthodox, but but future looking, and um, and and another kind. And here's another thing: like uh, Westerners always hear from the most radical, intolerant, rigid. Islamic voices that that makes the news, and the same is true in in my part of the world. What we hear from America is the most yeah. intolerant rhetoric. Well, that's right. When a when a like a pastor said he will burn the Quran uh, a year ago, like uh, I mean, people don't hear about pastors in Turkey. But when he said that he will do that, that became news for many and days. Probably it was big news when George Bush said that he invaded Iraq because God told him to do. Yeah, so. and that he said it was a crusade. Exactly. That's what that's what stick, sticks to people's mind for for uh, for a long time. Uh, that's why we should in both civilizations, in both the Muslim world, where I come from, and in both in the West, we should not just buy into the you know temptation. To see enemies and evil people out there, and to 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 justify that by only seeing the most radical people in that camp, uh, but try to understand uh, other uh, side, and uh, to to be open minded in the first place. When is your book going to be finished? Uh, my book is uh, it's done. It's coming out this July. You have a publisher. Everything's my, fixed. Yeah, up publisher in July. is Norton, and it's coming out this July. Uh, and it's Islam without extremes: a Muslim case for liberty. Fine. Okay, good. We look forward to it. Thank you so much. Than the Mises uh, store. Thank you for I'll coming and bringing your message. Wonderful, uh, scholarly, fascinating, challenging message to us to Auburn. Thank you, Jeff. It's my pleasure.